Well, hello, friends. Welcome to this very special teaching brought to you by True Riches Academy. The title of today's teaching is Civil Disobedience and the Bible. My name is Jerry Robinson. I'm the founder here of the Academy, and I'm also the host of True Riches Radio. You can find us online at truerichesradio.com. Very excited to bring you this brand new teaching, Civil Disobedience and the Bible. Let's move right in. And the overview for today's teaching is that we're going to go through 10 biblical examples of civil disobedience. There are numerous examples of civil disobedience in the Bible. And I believe in this current time of great political tension that we have today, and even ethnic tension, it's important for us to remember what the Bible has to say about civil disobedience, what it looks like, and how we are to respond to the state. Uh, we're also going to talk about what we can learn from these examples, and then we'll have some concluding thoughts. Now, we have received so many responses to our teachings this year. We've been doing a, a monthly teaching series all year long here in 2021, and many responses have come, especially to our teachings on the American Revolution. So if you have not watched our teaching a biblical view of the American Revolution, you can find that on truerichesradio.com forward slash American Revolution. And there, for those of you who haven't seen it, we basically provide a biblical overview of how the Bible would view revolt. What does the Bible say about obeying kings? What does it say about revolution? And we talked quite a bit in that video. And in fact, it appears from the comments that we've received, we ruffled some feathers. We stepped on some political philosophies. And because our aim here is not to tickle ears, but to challenge believers to think and thinkers to believe, we were ready for the responses, although not all the, of the responses we received were very Christ-like. In fact, some of them were downright uh, naughty, we would even say. Let me just give you one example, and I'll give you an example of one that doesn't fall into the naughty uh, category. I really respected the overall comment that was made, and I want to share this with you because, really, this is why we have created this teaching, Civil Disobedience in the Bible, because it does appear that the major pushback to our teachings on the American Revolution and perhaps its unbiblical nature is largely rooted in the understanding that we are not always to obey kings. When you look at the book, uh, for example, of Romans, look at chapter 13, it does tell us to be subject to the governing authorities. And what many of the commenters were telling us uh, here at True Riches was that, but the Bible doesn't tell us that we always have to obey the king. There are exceptions, and we agree. Uh, this comment makes that point. Let me show you this comment here. This is from Mrs. H on YouTube. Please remember Acts 529 says, but Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than any human authority. If the authority opposes God and his word, we follow God, not man. Scripture has many examples of kings being held to account by God. Example of Daniel 4. Furthermore, Romans 13 does not teach that Christians must always obey the governing authorities no matter what. The one exception to the general rule of obedience is when man's laws are in direct conflict with the plainly revealed law of God. Examples of God's people practicing civil disobedience include Peter and John defying the Sanhedrin, as found in Acts 4 and 5, the Hebrew midwives refusing to practice infanticide, Exodus 1, Daniel ignoring the Persian law concerning prayer, Daniel chapter 6, and Daniel's friends refusing to bow to the king's image, Daniel chapter 3. So as a general rule, we are to obey the government. The lone exception is when obeying man's law would force us to directly disobey God's law. So there's the comment from Mrs. H on YouTube. And in essence, what the argument here is, is that the Christian's responsibility to obey government ends when the government demands that we violate God's law. I would agree 100% with what this commenter has said. It is absolutely when the government demands that you and I, or that God's people, violate God's law, that we must draw a line in the sand. That yes, we are to submit to the governing authorities, as Romans 13 says, as 1 Peter 2 says, as the book of Titus says, but there does come a time when the governing authorities would tell us to violate God's law. And when or if they do this, this would be one step too far. 
And at this point, it would be incumbent upon us as God's people, as Christians, to not obey that ungodly law that violates God's law. So I agree 100% with this. But I think this actually brings us to a question. And the reason why I'm using this comment to begin this teaching is because it really sets up perfectly this teaching because it leads us to a question regarding the American Revolution. And that is, how did the King of England, King George III, force 18th century Americans to violate God's law? After all, if we agree that if the government causes us to violate God's law or impels us to violate God's law, that we must not obey them, then the question obviously arrives, how did King George III, the King of England, force the colonists living in 18th century America, how did he force them to violate God's law? What did he command them to do that was a line too far? What was over the line? And in fact, we can go to the Declaration of Independence and actually see the list of complaints that the American colonists had against King George III. In fact, there's 27 complaints in the Declaration of Independence. You can read the document online. The text is available for anyone to read. But you'll read that many of these complaints look like this. He has refused to pass laws. And these laws might be things that the early Americans wanted him to pass. Uh, he has called together legislative bodies at places unusual, uncomfortable, and distant. Uh, he has erected a multitude of new offices. He has kept among us in times of peace standing armies without the consent of our legislatures. Okay, so you're seeing some of the grievances, some of the complaints in the Declaration of Independence here by the colonists regarding what King George III had erred in doing. And we continue, for imposing taxes upon us without our consent, for transporting us beyond seas to be tried for pretended offenses. So here we have just a sampling of many of the complaints that were levied against the King of England by the American colonists. And so when we see this list, we would ask ourselves, do any of these complaints anything in the Declaration of Independence or anything that we know of about American history meet the biblical criteria that we've already just laid out for engaging in civil disobedience. What is the biblical criteria? Well, the king must command that you violate God's law. And do we have an example of this as specifically regarding the American Revolution? Did the American colonists ever accuse the king of England of forcing them to violate God's law? Now, this is a very important question that I think we must address if we're going to say that the American Revolution meets the biblical criteria for engaging in civil disobedience. Now, one more question we would ask is that if somehow we were to determine that the King of England did indeed request and mandate that the early American colonists violate God's law through some action? If so, what biblical precedent would support the idea that resisting the king would require Christians to take up arms against a Christian country? So this is, of course, is assuming that the king of England has made a request or has mandated the colonists to expressly violate the law of God, that if he indeed did that, what biblical precedent would support the idea that these Christians who have been told to violate God's law by the King of England, what biblical precedent would they have to take up arms and formed an organized rebellion against a fellow Christian country? And this question is perhaps a little less obvious to those who believe that the American Revolution was somehow biblical, because we must recall that the American Revolution was an act of Christian-on-Christian -Christian bloodshed. That is, the bloodshed at the American Revolution occurred as American Christians took up the sword against their own brothers and countrymen, their fellow British Christians. Put simply, the American Revolution led to Christian-on-Christian -Christian bloodshed as brother took up arms against his fellow Christian brother. And if these early Americans were Christians, we must logically assume that they believed that Christ, the Prince of Peace, smiled upon and approved of their bloodshed of their fellow British Christian brothers. Again, the British troops were not Muslims. The British troops were not Buddhists. 
They were not atheists. They were not communists. They were not socialists. They were not Marxists. They were Christian. And in fact, not just Christian, but many times the very same denomination as the American revolutionaries who were fighting them. So you actually had Anglicans fighting Anglicans, Presbyterians engaged in war against Anglicans. So you, you literally had Protestants picking up arms to kill their fellow Protestant brothers. In some cases, sons killing fathers, fathers killing uncles, uncles and grandfathers, right? Families, men of the same religious persuasion who all served the same Jesus. Jesus, by the way, tells us to turn the other cheek and also to not do any kind of evil to our enemies. In this case, we are to believe that Jesus wants Christians to kill Christians as an act of civil disobedience. And of course, much of this was done in the name of God, right? If you believe the stories of men like David Barton, uh, historians, or some might say pseudo-historians, who emphasize that the American Revolution was biblical, well, we have to ask ourselves, what is the biblical precedent for this? What biblical precedent would we have for a Christian to take up arms against a fellow Christian? Remember, I want to stress this before we continue, is that the King of England, King George III, was a Christian. He led a Christian nation. He led a Christian country. And the American revolutionaries were from the same churches. In fact, the early Americans were from the same churches. Many of them were from the Church of England itself. And they were certainly Protestants. So they were all believing in the same God. So this is problematic for us. We have to discern what is happening here. So with that laid now as our foundation, let us consider 10 examples from the Bible where the government instructed God's people to violate God's law. And let's consider the response that we see in the Bible to these ungodly actions. And then we will compare these biblical examples to the American Revolution so as to see if we can answer these questions. So we begin with example one. The Hebrew midwives disobey and lie to Pharaoh. We find this in the book of Exodus chapter 1 verses 15 through 21. Let's check it out. It says, Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shiprah, and the name of the other Puah. And he said, When you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women, and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this thing and saved the male children alive? And the midwives said to Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So what is the ungodly request here made by Pharaoh? Well, the ungodly request is clear. It's to kill the unborn. This is clearly against God's law. God has a law against murder. And if you kill an innocent baby once it's born and you throw it into the river or however they were killing these children, this would be a violation of God's law. What was the godly response? Well, the godly response by the midwives was to refuse to kill the unborn. So we have to ask ourselves then, did the godly response include violence against the king or the government? Because remember, we're looking for an example here that would give us a precedent for civil disobedience to include violence against the king for making an ungodly law, or more specifically, for enforcing God's people to violate God's law? And the answer is clearly no. In fact, the only one doing the violence in this story are the ungodly. The godly are the ones who are protecting life. They are the ones who are saving life. They are not killing. Let's continue to the second example of civil disobedience in the Bible, and it involves a woman by the name of Rahab who was living in the city of Jericho, and she disobeys the king of that town. Let's read the account in Joshua chapter 2. Now, there's 
quite a bit here, but we're just going to read a couple of verses to help us see what this story is all about. Joshua chapter 2, verses 1 through 4, first part of 4. Now Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out two men from Acacia Grove to spy secretly, saying, Go, view the land, especially Jericho. So they went and came to the house of a harlot named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, men have come here tonight from the children of Israel to search out the country. So the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring out the men who have come to you, who have entered your house, for they have come to search out all the country. Then the woman took the two men and hid them. So now what is the ungodly request in this particular instance, this particular account in the book of Joshua? Well, the ungodly request is that Rahab turn over the Hebrew spies to the king of Jericho. Did she obey? No, she didn't. In fact, she denies the king's request. The godly response is to protect the lives of the Hebrew spies who were operating under the guidance and direction of the God of Israel. So in this example, did the godly response to the ungodly request include violence against the king or the government? And the answer is clearly no. Rahab does not in any way, shape, or form commit violence. Instead, she protects God's people from the violence of the ungodly government. Let's consider another example, example number three of civil disobedience in the Bible. Here we have Hebrew soldiers defending Jonathan from King Saul's wrath. In this case, we're dealing with a king of Israel. We find the account in 1 Samuel chapter 14. We'll read just a portion of this account from that particular chapter of 1 Samuel. And the men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had placed the people under oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until evening, before I have taken vengeance on my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. Now all the people of the land came to a forest, and there was honey on the ground. And when the people had come into the woods, there was the honey dripping. But no one put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan had not heard his father charge the people with the oath. Therefore he stretched out the end of the rod that was in his hand, and dipped it in a honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth. And his countenance brightened. Then one of the people said, Your father strictly charged the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. And the people were faint. Then Saul, the king, said to Jonathan, his son, Tell me what you have done. And Jonathan told him, and said, I only tasted a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand. So now I must die. Saul answered, God do so and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. But the people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who has accomplished this great deliverance in Israel? Certainly not. As the Lord lives, not one hair of his head shall fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, and he did not die. So this is certainly an unusual story we find in the Bible, but clearly... There is an ungodly request made by the king, and that is to kill anyone who eats on this particular day, and specifically to kill Jonathan, the son of the king. What is the godly response? Well, the people of God stand in the gap to protect the life of Jonathan from the fury of the king so as to prevent him from committing an ungodly action. In this example, then, did the godly response by the people include violence against the king or the government? And the answer is clearly no. Once again, God's people step in to protect a godly man from an ungodly edict from the king. But in no way do the men raise their swords to the king or commit violence against the government. Let's consider another example of civil disobedience in the Bible. Example number four, Obadiah hides prophets from Queen Jezebel's wrath. We read about this in 1 Kings chapter 18. Let's read the account. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly, for so it was while Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them, 50 to a cave, and had fed them with bread and water. 
So in this example, what is the ungodly request by the government? Well, it is to kill God's true prophets, right? to put them to death. What is the godly response? The godly response by Obadiah, a man of God, is to once again protect the lives of these true prophets. At this point, we should begin to start seeing a theme here, a recurring theme. That is that the ungodly request often involves violence and the godly response often involves protecting from that violence. So in this example, did the godly response by Obadiah, the man of God, include violence against the king or the government? And the answer is clearly no. All right, let's continue to another example. This example number five is the account where three Hebrew boys refused to bow down to the Babylonian king's golden image. Now, this is a fairly lengthy story that many people are familiar with, so we're just going to read a brief excerpt, but you can read the entire account in the book of Daniel, chapter 3, verses 1 through 30. Very interesting story, where th three brave Hebrew boys named Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refuse to bow down to an idol made by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon. In response, they are thrown into a fiery furnace. We'll read a little excerpt here from Daniel chapter 3, verse 16 through 18, which shows their response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. So in this example, what is the ungodly request made by the government to God's people? That is to worship a false idol. And what is the godly response? The godly response is to refuse to bow down to the false idol. These three brave Hebrew boys risk a fiery death so as not to disobey God's commands, not to serve other gods, nor to bow down to them. So does the godly response by these three brave Hebrew boys include violence against the king or the government for making this ungodly request? And the answer is no. In fact, the only violence in this story comes from the ungodly actions of the government against these three men of God. Let's move on to example number six, where we see the prophet Daniel as he defies the king's edict to not pray to God. Now, we find this story in the book of Daniel, chapter six. And in this case, we're not going to read this account because it is a fairly lengthy account. I encourage you to read it on your own. You can read it in the book of Daniel, chapter six. But a fairly brief summary of this story involves King Darius issuing an edict or a decree after being tricked by his advisors that states that no one in his kingdom is allowed to pray to anyone else except him for a period of time. Now, the king was tricked into signing this decree and issuing this edict by some of his own advisors who were enemies of the godly prophet Daniel, and they were hoping to ensnare Daniel through this law and have him put to death because the requirement of failing to keep this decree would be death. In fact, this is the story where we hear about Daniel being thrown into the den of lions for not following this decree. Instead, what Daniel does is he openly prays to God anyway, in spite of this ungodly decree, because he must obey God rather than men. So what is the ungodly request made here by the government? Well, it is that no one can pray to God. Then what is the godly response by the prophet Daniel? It is to defy the king's edict and to pray to God anyway. So does this godly response by the prophet Daniel include violence against the king or the government for forcing people to keep such an ungodly law? And the answer is clearly no. Indeed, the only violence being done here is through an ungodly act of government against a man of God. Let's now turn to another example, example number seven, where the wise men who come and travel from the east to visit the Messiah at his birth disobey the King Herod. We find this account in Matthew chapter two, verses seven through 12. And it reads, then Herod, when he had secretly called the wise men, determined from them what time the star appeared. And he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search carefully for 
for the young child. And when you have found him, bring back word to me that I may come and worship him also. When they heard the king, they departed. And when they had come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary, his mother, and fell down and worshiped him. Then, being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. Now, for more context to the story, you may recall that the King Herod, in his mad search for the Messiah who was predicted to be born during this time, orders the slaughter of all baby boys two years and younger. And in fact, Mary and Joseph are warned about this act ahead of time in a dream, and they flee to the country of Egypt for a period of time. So what is the ungodly request made here by the government? Well, it is to report the location of the Messiah. Why? In essence, to have the Messiah killed, right? Herod is seeking out this Christ child so as to prevent him from becoming king. Herod is jealous, and he does not want a competitor to his throne. And he is using the wise men to do his bidding to find this Christ child so that he may locate him because he's unable to locate him on his own. Now, this is the ungodly request from the king, from the government. What is the godly response? Well, the wise men disobey the king's request after being warned in a dream. Clearly, they are violating the request of the king. They are clearly refusing to obey the king in preference of obedience to the dream that they had had from God. But did the godly response include violence against the king or government on the part of these three wise men? The answer is clearly no. In fact, the only intended violence in this story is that done by the ungodly King Herod wishing to commit violence against the Christ child after already committing violence against many newborn babies all across his district. Okay, let's consider another example, example number eight. The Jewish Sanhedrin forbids the preaching of Jesus' name. We find this account in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verses 17 through 20. So here we are now in the book of Acts, after Christ has been crucified, buried, resurrected from the dead, has given the great commission to his apostles, and has ascended back to the Father. And here we pick up in the book of Acts, chapter 4, verse 17, where the Jewish authorities who have authority and are serving as governing authorities over the apostles state, but so that it spreads no further, speaking of the gospel and the, the name of Jesus, among the people, let us severely threaten them, the, the apostles, that from now on they speak to no man in this name. So they called them, the apostles, and commanded them not to speak at all, nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So now in this example, what is the ungodly request made by the governing authorities to these men of God? It is to order them to cease engaging in the Great Commission. Now, while we read in the apostolic letters, Romans chapter 13, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13 and 17, also in the book of Titus, we read the importance of obeying the governing authorities. As we have stated, there does come a point when we must obey God rather than men. And in this case, the Jewish authorities were telling the apostles to do the exact opposite of what Jesus had told them to do. Jesus told them to preach the gospel unto all creatures obviously using his name, the name of Jesus. And the Jewish authorities have come and specifically told them not to do what Jesus has told them to do and to cease engaging in the Great Commission and teaching in the name of Jesus. What is the godly response by the apostles to this request that is ungodly? Well, it is to continue preaching in Jesus' name. But does this godly response include violence on the part of the apostles against the Jewish authorities for making this ungodly request? And the answer is clearly no. Now we have two more examples ahead of us as we near our conclusion. Example number nine, we have once again the Jewish authorities at the Sanhedrin, which was the high court of the Jewish state, forbidding the preaching of Jesus' name once again. We read this account in the book of Acts, chapter 5, verse 27 through 29. And it reads, 
And when they had brought them, the apostles, they sat them before the council, that is, there at the Jewish court. And the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Now this verse, of course, and this statement by Peter and the other apostles, that we must obey God rather than men, is a biblical defense that I often hear for the American Revolution. But note that this has nothing to do with anything related to a violent revolution against the king. In fact, what we see here is that the ungodly request made by the Jewish governing authorities at the Sanhedrin, the high court in ancient Judaism, the request is for the apostles, again, to cease engaging in the Great Commission by teaching in Jesus' name. And what is the godly response to this very ungodly decree? It is to continue preaching in Jesus' name by the apostles. So does this godly and righteous response by the apostles to continue preaching in Jesus' name include violence against the Jewish governing authorities for making such an ungodly request? And the answer is clearly no. So now we turn to our final example of civil disobedience in the Bible. And in this case, we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 13, where we see that the beast from the earth commands all men to worship the image of the beast. We can find this account in the book of Revelation, chapter 13, verses 11 through 17. We'll just read a part of this account. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now, in this particular account, we are dealing with a prophecy of something that had not yet happened when it was written by the Apostle John, the Revelator. So this example is rather unique in that respect. Nevertheless, we do see an act of civil disobedience that is apparent in this account from the fact that there are going to be those who will not worship the image of the beast. And what will happen to those people who refuse to worship the image of the beast? They will be killed. Notice that it does not say that those who are asked to worship the image of the beast will kill those in government who ask them to worship the image of the beast, but instead they will be killed themselves for failing to worship the image of the beast. So what is the ungodly request made by the government or the king or the governing authorities in this particular example? It is to worship the image of the beast. And as God's people know, worship is reserved for God alone. Therefore, if a government tells us to worship something else, or if some governing authority tells us that we are to worship something else or someone else or an image of something, which is similar to what we saw in the book of Daniel chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who refused to bow down to the golden image erected by King Nebuchadnezzar. In fact, this is actually, in some ways, a foreshadowing of this event that occurs in the book of Revelation. Then again, the ungodly request made by the governing authorities in this account is to worship something other than God. And what is the godly response in this example from the book of Revelation? It is to refuse to worship the image of the beast. That is, those who are godly during this time refuse to bow down or worship the image of the beast. And we know that some will not do that because they will be killed, the Bible tells us. So does the godly response to this command to worship the image of the beast by the governing authorities include violence against the government? on the part of the godly? And the answer, yet once again, is no. Indeed, the only violence that occurs in this example is that that is done by the ungodly governing authorities that command the people of God to violate God's law. So now that we have considered these 10 examples of civil disobedience directly from the Bible, let us proceed with a few questions and then we'll conclude with a few final thoughts. The first question we would ask is, do any 
of these biblical examples of civil disobedience involve God's people taking up arms against their oppressors? And the answer is no. How about another question? Do any of these biblical examples of civil disobedience involve God's people engaging in violent revolt, even organized violent revolt? And the answer is no. Now, turning back to the topic at hand, let's remember now the American Revolution and put this in context. Did the King of England demand that American colonists kill the unborn or innocent, as we see in these examples where the Hebrew midwives were told to kill the Hebrew children as they were being born, or even as King Herod did whenever he sought to have the babies killed and wanted the wise men to report the location of the Christ child to him so that he could actually have him killed as well. Did the King of England commit anything similar to this? And the answer is no. Did the King of England, similar to King Nebuchadnezzar, who asked Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to bow down to a false idol, or even the beast of the earth, who causes all men to worship the image of the beast? Did King George III demand that American colonists bow down and worship a false idol? And the answer is no. Did the King of England demand that American colonists kill God's prophets or try to prevent the colonists from protecting God's prophets? And the answer is no. Did King George III tell American colonists that they could not pray to God? The answer is no. Before we continue, just think for a moment if this actually had happened. If the King of England had issued an edict stating that the American colonists could not pray to God, then what would the biblical precedent be? It would be to copy that of Daniel, and that would be to pray to God anyway. But would there be a precedent to raise the sword or foment an armed rebellion against the king for making such an ungodly request? We have no such example from the Bible, do we? So the answer is no. Another question, did the king of England demand that American colonists not preach in Jesus' name? The answer is clearly no. Now, if the answer is no to all of these very direct questions that are taken directly from the Bible, that some people actually use these examples, by the way, to defend the actions of the American Revolution, quoting things like Peter, where we must obey God rather than men, then the American Revolution does not qualify as a biblical act of civil disobedience. Now, let us address one final question before we move into our concluding thoughts on this matter. And this question perhaps is the most relevant and important for our generation. Because today, friends, we live in a time in the United States of America where the political polarization is off the charts. And if history is any indicator, it is increasingly likely that we will see another instance of bloodshed in our country as American citizens take up arms to address their particular grievances. We saw it, of course, in the American Revolution, which we talked about the Christian-on-Christian -Christian bloodshed. We also saw it in the Civil War, and we've talked about the Civil War on other teachings before, about how that was another example of Christian-on-Christian -Christian bloodshed. Christians in the North, and Christians in the South armed to the teeth and killing each other over various rights, particularly the right to hold chattel slaves. Therefore, this question is extremely important for our purposes, and that is if the American Revolution was biblically justified in 1776, why is it not even more so today? Remember that many of the grievances listed in the Declaration of Independence may seem relatively tame today by modern standards. Certainly taxes are much higher than they were underneath King George III. And ironically, underneath the Christian nation led by King George III, abortion was not a legal right for every man. Homosexuality was not a legal right. Homosexual marriage was not a legal right under the Christian king. Blasphemy against God 
was not legal underneath the Christian king of England. So it is understandable on some accounts why so many American evangelicals seem to want to take the country back because what America has become through its founding documents is a paradise for blasphemy and a paradise for heresy. Finally, if American pulpits refuse to point out the clear, unbiblical nature of the American Revolution and the Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed that it inspired, then they will be woefully unprepared to counteract the next revolution that it will inevitably happen in this country. By praising revolution as a means to an end and calling it godly, how then can the preacher turn around and deny that a future revolution would be biblical and godly? How can a preacher celebrate the Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed of 1776 through fireworks and burnt offerings, i.e. barbecue, and yet condemn future acts of Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed as ungodly? In his second epistle, the blessed apostle Peter warns that it is untaught and unstable people who twist to their own destruction the scriptures. And that word destruction is the word perdition. It is the way of destruction, the broad road that leads to destruction. It is the error of the lawless that twists the scriptures so as to call good evil and evil good and light dark and dark light. Now, in our final moments, let's just consider a few concluding thoughts. Number one, far too many American Christians today rely upon unbiblical notions to support the American Revolution. And I think that is clear from today's teaching. The examples of civil disobedience that we have shown from the Bible today in no way defend violence on the part of the ungodly against ungodly government. Instead, they show quite the opposite. They show that the violence comes from the ungodly government against the godly. It is dangerous to mix modern political philosophies with the Bible, as it puts us at great risk of slipping into the mystery of lawlessness and that error that accompanies it. Two, many American Christians today do not know that many 18th century Christians viewed the American Revolution as a sin. The reason for this is quite clear, that the victors write the history. But there are many books, not enough, but many, that tell the story of men like John Wesley, who was the founder of Methodism here in the United States. And Wesley was vehemently against the Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed of the American Revolution. And he was not alone. There were many preachers who spoke out against the Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed that occurred in the American Revolution, preferring to turn the other cheek, preferring to pay the higher taxes, preferring not to do violence to their own Christian brothers for the sake of the Lord and for the sake of their very own conscience. The pulpits of America need to revive these teachings. They need to revive the voices of these godly men who sought to prevent Christian-on-Christian Christian bloodshed in 1776 and beyond. Number three, a lack of understanding of what the Bible says about this topic could lead us to repeat the same mistakes in the future. There's an old and popular saying often attributed to George Santayana and other times to the British statesman Winston Churchill that goes something like this. Those who fail to learn from history are doomed to repeat it. A couple of years ago, I wrote an article entitled, What are the Moral Lessons of the American Revolution? And I was surprised when it automatically hit the top of Google as the number one search result. The reason? Because no such article already existed. There is hardly any critique of the Christian on Christian violence and bloodshed that we saw from the American Revolution evident in America's pulpits today. Just when we need them most, just as the violence is ramping up, just as Americans are armed to the teeth and angry and madder at their government than ever, 
We have conspiracy theories like QAnon and many others that are infiltrating the American church, while the call to love one's enemy and to pursue Christ as the Prince of Peace grows dimmer and dimmer. Now our fourth and final point. Christians are required to live up to a different standard than the world. That is, Christians have been given a different nature, a new nature in Christ Jesus, and we engage in a different form of warfare. Yes, wars are natural for mankind, but they are not natural for those with a new nature. They are not natural for Christians, and the weapons of our warfare are not the AK-47. They include the sword of the Spirit and the battle armor of God. They are spiritual in nature. And yet, how can a nation that has been told that semi-automatic weapons that are designed specifically to kill other people are a God-given right, how can they hear, how can they see that their weapons are not carnal when they have been told that God blesses their semi-automatic rifle and he blesses their physical weapons of warfare and that he blesses their killing of the enemy and that he even blesses the killing of their own Christian brothers. How can that nation hear the truth? How can that nation see the truth? Well, this teaching could go on and on, couldn't it? But we're going to have to bring it to a close. Have you been challenged by this teaching? If so, my request to you is, is that you would consider sharing it with someone who needs to hear it. Today, there are a tremendous number of Americans who are angry at their government, and they are armed to the teeth. And the pulpits seem eerily silent on the need for calm and on the need for love, not only of one's Christian brother, but love of enemy. We can choose to follow the way of the world, or we can choose to follow the Prince of Peace. There are two ways. Which way will you choose? Hi friends, Jerry Robinson here from TrueRichesRadio.com. I hope you enjoyed today's teaching. It was designed to challenge you in your thinking. And if you have a comment or a question about today's teaching, we'd love to hear it. I read every single comment that comes into us here at True Riches Radio, and I'd love to hear from you. If you have a scripture to share or maybe a comment that you'd like to share with us, simply go to TrueRichesRadio.com and click on the contact button and send your message right to us. You can also register for our ongoing 2021 Bible teaching series so that you can attend these teachings live once a month. You'll find that link on truerichesradio.com. And if you're not already receiving our free email newsletter, you can sign up right there on our website, truerichesradio.com, and get all of our latest articles, video teachings, and podcasts sent directly to your inbox. In addition to our website, you can find many videos on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash True Riches Academy. There you'll find many different playlists with one playlist on the topic of America and the Bible with more than 40 videos in it. So if this is a topic that we've been talking about today, you'd like to go into deeper, be sure to check out our YouTube channel and check out the America and the Bible playlist for more than 40 videos on this topic. And you can also find us on social media. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash True Riches Radio. You can find us on Twitter at True Riches Radio. And again, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash True Riches Academy. We have a gargantuan task of challenging believers to think in the 21st century. And you can help us by sharing our messages, sharing videos, sharing podcasts, sharing articles from our website with those you love, with those who need to hear it. Would you consider doing that? I pray you will. And once again, I thank you for attending today's very special teaching. 